from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe 2020, virtual. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and ecosystem partners. Welcome back. This is theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon CloudNativeCon, the European show for 2020. I'm your host, Stu Miniman, and when we talk about the container world, we talk about what's happening in, in cloud native. Uh, storage has been one of those sticking points, uh, one of those things that you know has been challenging that we've been looking to mature, and really happy to welcome back to the program two of our CUBE alumni to give us the update on the state of storage for the container world. Both of them are co-founders and CEOs. Uh, first of all, we have Shang Liang uh, from Rancher Labs, who of course was recently acquired uh, by SUSE, the, 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 the intention to acquire, uh, and also joining us, Merle Thurumale, uh, who is with Portworks. Uh, Shang and Merle, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Stu. All right, so uh, Merle, I actually am going to start with you just because you know, we, we've seen you know, a, a couple of waves of companies working uh, on storage uh, in this environment. We know storage is difficult, um, and, and the, when we change uh, how we're building things, that there's architectural things that can happen. Uh, so maybe if you could just give us a snapshot, uh, you know, Portworks, uh, you know, was, was created to help attack this, uh, you know, straight on uh, here in 2020, you know, where you see things uh, in, in the overall uh, kind of container storage landscape. Uh, absolutely, Stu. Before I kind of jump into Portworks, I just want to take uh, a minute to publicly uh, congratulate uh, the, the whole Rancher team and, uh, and uh, Shang and uh, Shannon and Will Chan. I've known those folks for a while. They're, they're kind of true entrepreneurs. They represent the, uh, the serial entrepreneur spirit that, uh, uh, that so many folks know in the Valley. And so, you know, great outcome for them. We're very happy for them and uh, a big congrats and shout out to the whole team. Um, Portworks uh, is, is a little over five years old and we've been kind of right from the inception of the company uh, recognized that to put containers in production, you're going to have to solve not just the app orchestration problem, but the issue of storage and data orchestration. And so in a nutshell, Kubernetes orchestrates containers and Portworks orchestrates storage and data. And more specifically by doing that, what we enable is and enterprises to be able to take apps that are containerized into production at scale and, and have high availability, disaster recovery, backup, you know, all of the things that for decades uh, IT has had to do and has done to support application reliability and availability. But essentially we're doing it for purpose with a purpose-built solution for containerized workloads. All right, Shang, uh, of course, storage is a piece of the overall puzzle that, that Rancher is trying to help with. Uh, maybe if you could just refresh our audience on Longhorn, uh, which your organization has, uh, it, it's open source. It's uh, now being managed by the CNCF is my understanding. So help us bring Longhorn into the discussion. Thanks, Stu. So um, uh, I'm really glad to be here. I mean, we've, uh, I think Rancher and Portworks started about the same time. And we started with a slightly different focus. Uh, you know, I think Mori is exactly right. Uh, to get containers going, you really need both sort of the compute angle, orchestrating uh, containers, as well as orchestrating uh, the storage and the data. So Rancher started with uh, uh, a, a slightly stronger focus on orchestrating containers themselves. But pretty quickly we realized as adoption of containers grow, we really need it to uh, be able to handle uh, our storage better. And uh, like any new technology, you know, uh, uh, Kubernetes and containers uh, created some interesting new requirements and opportunities. And at the time, uh, really there weren't uh, a, a lot of good technologies available. Uh, you know, technologies like Rook and Ceph at the time was very, very premature. I think um, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, we actually early on tried to incorporate uh, uh, the, the cluster technology and it was just, uh, you know, it was just not easy. And, and at the time, I think Portworx was a, uh, uh, very busy developing 
uh, what turned out to be you know their um, uh, flagship product, uh, which we end up end up uh, uh, partnering very very closely. But uh, but early on, we we really had no choice but to start developing our own storage technology. So Longhorn, as a piece of container storage technology, is actually almost as old as Rancher itself. Uh, one of our founding engineers we hired, he he ended up you know working on it, and then over the years, uh, uh, you know the focus shift. The, I think the original version was like written in C plus plus, and over the years, it's now being completely rewritten in Golan. It was originally written more for Docker workload. Now, of course, everything is Kubernetes centric. And 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 last year we, uh, uh, you know, we we decided to uh, donate uh, the Longhorn uh, open source uh, project to CNCF. And now it's a CNCF sandbox project. And uh, the adoption is just growing really quickly. And and just earlier this year we. We finally uh, uh, decided to uh, we're, we're ready to offer commercial support for it. So, so that's uh, that's where Rancher is, and with uh, Longhorn and the container storage technology. Yeah, it had been really interesting to watch in this ecosystem. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, at, at one of the KubeCon shows, uh, I was talking to people coming out of the. Uh, I believe it was the SIG, the you know the special interest group for storage, and it was just like wow, it was heated. You know, words were you know back and forth. There, there, there's uh, not a lot of agreement there. Uh, anybody that knows the storage industry knows that you know standards and in, in various uh, uh, ways of doing things often are contentious, and there, there's there's differences of of opinion. Heck, you look at the storage industry. Uh, you know, there, there's a reason why there, there's so many different solutions out there. Um, so maybe I'd love to hear, Merle, from your standpoint, sounds like things are coming to get a, a little bit more. Um, there are still a number of options out there. Um, so, you know, why is this kind of co-opetition uh, actually good for the industry? Yeah, I think this is a, a, a classic example of co-opetition, right? Uh, let's, let's start with the cooperation part, right? The first part of that. The the uh, you know the early days of CNCF and even sort of the Google Kubernetes team I think was really very focused on compute and and subsequent years in the last three four years there's been a greater attention to making the whole stack work because that's what it's going to take to take a uh, a enterprise class production and put it in uh, you know enterprise class application and put it in production so extensions like CNI for networking and CSI container storage interface. Uh, were, were kind of uh, put together by a working group, and and uh, uh, you know both both in the CNCF, but also within the Kubernetes Google community. Uh, you talked about say, storage as an example, and uh, you know as always happens, right? Like it's it, it looks a little bit in the early days like uh, like a polo game, right? Where folks are really uh, you know uh, seemingly uh, you know. <laughs> working with each other on uh, on top of the pool, but underneath they're kicking each other furiously. But that was a long time back and we've graduated from then into really cooperating. And I think it's something we should all be proud of where now the CSI interface is really a, a really a very, very strong and complete solution to allowing Kubernetes to orchestrate storage and data. So it's really strengthened both Kubernetes and the Kubernetes ecosystem. Now the competition part, let's kind of spend, I want to spend a couple of minutes on that too, right? Uh, you know, uh, one of the classic things uh, that people sometimes confuse is the difference between an overlay and an interface. Uh, CSI is wonderful because it defines how the two layers of, of uh, essentially kind of uh, old style storage, you know, whether it's a SAN or a cloud, uh, elastic storage uh, bucket or all of those interact with Kubernetes. So the the definition of that interface kind of lays down some rules and parameters for how that interaction should happen. However, you still always need an overlay like Portworks uh, that, that actually drives that interface and enables uh, Kubernetes to actually manage that storage. Uh, and, and that's where the competition is. And, you know, Sheng mentioned Ceph and Gluster and Rook and kind of derivatives of those. And I think those have been around 
uh, really venerable and, and really excellent products for uh, born in a different era for a different time, OpenStack, object storage, and all of that, not really meant for kind of primary workloads. And they've been, they've been trying to be adapted for, for, for us for this kind of workload. Uh, Portworks is really a, a, a built from right from the inception to be designed for Kubernetes and for Kubernetes workloads at enterprise scale. And so I think, um, you know, as I as I look at the the landscape, we welcome the fact that that there are so many more people acknowledging that there is a vital need for data orchestration on Kubernetes. Right. That that's why everybody and their brother now has a CSI interface. Uh, however, I think there is a big difference between having an interface versus actually having the software that provides the functionality for HA, DR, and, um, and for backup uh, as, as the kind of life cycle matures, and doing it not just at scale, but in a way that allows uh, kind of really uh, a significant removal or reduction of the storage admin role and replaces it with self-service. Uh, that is fully automated within Kubernetes. Yeah, if I can, uh, you know, add something that to that, I completely agree. I mean, over the year, and Longhorn's been around for a long time, like I said, but uh, I'm, I'm really happy that over the years, it hasn't really impacted our wonderful uh, collaborative uh, partnership with Portworks. I mean, Portworks has always been uh, one of our premier partners. Uh, we have a lot of uh, 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 common customers. And as far as I know, uh, uh, these guys uh, rave about Portworks. I don't think they'll ever get off Portworks, uh, uh, Longhorn or not. Uh, the, exactly like Maury said, you know, in the, in the uh, storage space, there's interface, which a lot of different implementations can plug in, and that's kind of how Rancher works. So we always tell people Rancher works with you know, three types of storage uh, implementations. One is uh, let we call legacy storage, you know, your NetApp, your EMC, your pure storage, and you know, those are really solid, but they were not certainly not designed to work with containers uh, uh, to start with, but it doesn't matter. They've all written uh, CSI interfaces that will enable containers to take advantage of. The second type is uh, some of the cloud uh, uh, block storage or uh, file storage services like EBS, EFS, uh, you know, Google Cloud Storage, and, 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 and support for these storage backend, the CSI drivers, practically come with Kubernetes itself. So those are very well supported but there's still a huge amount of opportunities uh, for uh, uh, the third type of, you know, we call container native storage. So that is where uh, uh, Portworks and uh, Longhorn and other solutions like, you know, Open EBS, uh, Storage OS, all these guys fit in. It's a very vibrant uh, uh, ecosystem of innovation going on there. So those solutions are able to create uh, basically, reliable storage from scratch, you know, when, from, from, from just local disks. And they're actually also able to add a lot of value on top of whatever traditional or cloud-based uh, persistent storage you already have. So, so the, whole syst uh, the whole ecosystem is developing very quickly. A lot of these solutions work with each other. And I think, to me, it's really less of a competition or even co-opetition. It, it, it's really more of uh, raising the bar for, uh, for the capabilities so that we can accelerate the amount of uh, workload that's been moved onto this wonderful Kubernetes platform. In the end, it'll benefit everyone. Well, it, it, I appreciate you both laying out some of the options. You know, Sheng, just a quick follow up on that. And I, I think back, if you went 15 years ago, it was often, oh, okay, I'm using my EMC for my block. I'm using my NetApp for the file. Uh, I'm wondering in the cloud native space, if, if we expect that you might have multiple uh, different data engine types in there. Uh, you mentioned, you know, I might want port works for my high performance. Uh, you, you said open EBS, uh, very popular in the last CNCF survey. Uh, might be another one there. So is it, do we think some of it is just kind of repeating itself um, that storage is not monolithic and in a microservice architecture, you know, different environments need different storage requirements. Yeah, I, I mean, quick, I love uh, uh, to hear Maury's view as well, especially about, you know, uh, about how the ecosystem is developing. But from my perspective, just the 
just a range of capabilities that now we expect out of storage vendors or data management vendors is just increased tremendously. You know, in the old days, if you can store blocks, store objects, store file, that's it, right? So now it's it, this is just table stakes. Then, then what comes um, uh, after that? There will be three, four, five diff, uh, uh, additional layers of requirements. Come all the way from backup, restore, DR, search, indexing, analytics. So I really think all of this could potentially uh, uh, all fall in the. Uh, uh, in the bucket of uh, uh, the, the storage ecosystem. And I just can't wait to see how this stuff will play out. I think we're still at very, very early stages. And, 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 and they'll, you know, what, 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 what containers did is they made the fundamentally the workload portable. But the data itself still holds a lot of gravity. And there's just, just so much work to do to leverage the fundamental workload portability, marry that with some form of uh, universal data management or data portability. I think that would really uh, 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 unleash uh, the, 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 the industry to the next level. Uh, Mori? Yeah, uh, Shang, I mean, couldn't, couldn't, you know, I've said it better, right? Let, let me, let me, uh, let me kind of give you a, a sample, right? We're at about 160 plus customers now, uh, you know, adding uh, uh, several by the month. Um, just with just with Rancher alone, right? We are we have common customers in Qualcomm, Nvidia, Expedient, Roche, Marchex, Western Asset Management, uh, you know, Charter Communications. So we are we're in production with a number of Rancher customers. Now, wh what do these customers want, and why are they kind of looking at a uh, a a Portworks class of solution to to use, uh, you know, Shang's example of the multiple types, right? Many times people can get started with something in the early days, which has a CSI interface with maybe say 10 nodes or eight to 10 nodes with a solution that, that allows them to at least kind of verify that they can run the stack up and down uh, with say, you know, a, uh, a, a rancher type of orchestrator of workloads that are, that are containerized uh, and, and a network plugin and, and, a, and a storage plugin. But really, once they start to get beyond 20 nodes or so, then there are problems that are very, very unique to containers and Kubernetes that pop up that you don't see in a uh, in a non-containerized environment, right? Um, some, what are some of these things, right? Simple examples are how can you actually run 10 to hundreds of containers on a server uh, with each one of those containers belonging to a different application and having different requirements? Um, how do you actually scale not to 16 nodes, which is sort of may, typically maybe max of what a SAN might go to, but hundreds and thousands of nodes like many of our customers are doing, right? Guys like T-Mobile, Comcast, they're running this thing at 600 thousands of nodes. So scale is one issue. Here is a critical, critical difference uh, that, that something that's designed for Kubernetes does, right? We are providing all of the storage functions that Sheng just described at container granularity versus machine granularity. One way to think about this is the old data center was a, a machine-based construct. Everything, you know, VMware is the leader sort of in that. All of the way you think of storage is via LUNs. You think of compute and CPUs. Everything sub subnets, right? All of traditional infrastructure is very, very machine-centric. What Kubernetes and containers do is move it into becoming an app-defined control plane, right? One of the things we're super excited about is the fact that Kubernetes is really not just a container orchestrator, but actually a orchestrator for infrastructure in, in an app-defined way. And by doing that, they have turned uh, you know, control of the infrastructure via Kubernetes over to a Kubernetes admin. The same person who uses Rancher uses Portworks at NVIDIA, for example, to manage storage as they'd use it to manage uh, the compute and to manage containers. And, and that's marvelous because now what, what has happened is this thing is now fully automated at scale and, and actually can, can uh, run without the intervention of a storage admin. No more trouble tickets, right? No more requests to say, hey, give me another 20 terabytes. All of that happens automatically with a solution like Portworx. And in fact, if you think about it, in the world of real-time services that we're all headed towards, right? Services like Uber now 
are expected in enterprises, machine learning, AI, all of these things, analytics that, that Cheng talked about are things that you expect to run in a fully automated way across vast amounts of data that are distributed, sometimes in the edge. And you can't do that unless you're fully automated and, and not requires storage uh, admin intervention. And that's kind of the solution that, that we provide. All right, well, we're, we're just about out of time. If, if I could, just the last piece is, you know, Merle and Shane, to, to talk about where we are with Longhorn, what we should expect to see uh, through the yes, re rest of this year. And I guess, Merle, for you too, you know, what differentiates Portworks from just, the, the, you know, the open source version? So, Cheng, maybe if we, we start with just kind of Longhorn in general and, and then Merle uh, from, from your standpoint. Yeah, so, so, so the goal of Longhorn is really to lower the bar for folks to run stateful workload on, on Kubernetes. We want, you know, the, the Longhorn is 100% open source and it's owned by CNCF now. So we, we uh, in terms of features and functionalities, it's obviously a, a small subset of what a true enterprise grade solution like Portworx or EMC or NetApp could provide. So there's just, you know, the storage uh, uh, feature set or the roadmap is very rich. I don't think it's not really Rancher's goal uh, or, or Longhorn's goal to, uh, you know, to try to turn itself into a, in, 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 into a plug-in replacement for these enterprise grade storage or data management solutions. But, but there, you know, there are some critical, critical feature gaps that we need to address. And, and that's what the team is going to be focusing on uh, perhaps for the rest of the year. Yeah, uh, Stu, I, I would uh, I would kind of you know echo what Cheng said, right? I think folks may get uh, started with solutions like Longhorn or even a plugin, like a connector plugin, with one of their existing storage vendors, whether it's Pure NetApp or or, or EMC. Uh, from our viewpoint, that's wonderful because that allows them to kind of graduate to where they're considering storage and data as part of the stack. They really should. That's the way they're going to succeed by by looking at it as a whole. And really, we, you know, this is a great way to get started on a proof of concept architecture where your focus initially is very much on the orchestration and the containerization part. But, but as Sheng pointed out, you know, what, what Rancher did, what Rancher did for Kubernetes was build a simple, elegant, robust solution that kind of democratized Kubernetes. We're doing the same thing for Kubernetes storage, right? What Portworks does is have a solution that is simple, elegant, fully automated, scalable and robust, but more importantly, it's a complete data platform, right? We, uh, we go where all these solutions start, but don't kind of venture forward. We are a full, complete lifecycle management for data across that whole lifecycle. So there's many, many customers now are buying Portworks and then adding DR right up front. And then a few months later, they might come back and add backup from Portworks. So, to Shang's point, right, because of the uniqueness of the Kubernetes workload, because it is an app-defined control plane, not machine-defined, what is happening is it's disrupting, uh, just, like, just like virtualization did. Veeam exists today because, because they focused on a VM version of, of uh, you know, the, the, uh, their backup solution. So the same thing is happening. Kubernetes uh, workloads are dis causing disruption of the DR and backup and storage markets with solutions like Portworks. Wonderful, well, Merle and Shank, thank you so much for the updates. Absolutely, the, the, the promise of containers, uh, as you were saying, Merle, is that that atomic unit uh, getting closer to the application really requires storage uh, to be a full and useful solution. So great to see the progress that's being made. Uh, thank you so much for joining. You're welcome, Shang. We look forward to, uh, to working with you as you reach for the stars. Uh, congratulations again. I look forward to that continuing partnership. Mori, and thank you, Stu, for the opportunity here. Absolutely, great talking to both of you, and stay tuned, lots more coverage of theCUBE, KubeCon, CloudNativeCon 2020 Europe. I'm Stu Miniman, and thank you for watching theCUBE.